And we are speaking with four of the 13 candidates for Chittenden County State Senate. There are six seats that are open in effect for these 13 candidates. And part one of our forum is now. Thank you so much for joining us. We have Tom Chastanay, Erica Reddick, Ginny Lyons, Phil Baruth. We're going to start with opening comments. Senator Phil Baruth, why are you running and what qualifies you for the position? Well, thanks, Lauren Glenn. I appreciate you hosting the debate again. Uh, I'm Phil Baruth. I'm finishing up my fifth term in the state Senate, so that's 10 years. And I guess what I would say about why I'm running is uh, we are not out of the woods on the pandemic yet. Uh, Senator Lyons and I just finished a historically long emergency style session trying to deal with uh, health and safety, federal money that we're trying to get out the door, making sure that we help Vermonters who are out of work, help Vermonters who need uh, cash to open their schools, open their businesses. So um, I'm committed to finishing that job. And I would say that's gonna be job number one for at least the next year, if not two. So um, I started my Senate terms with Tropical Storm Irene, mm -hmm. and we're now at, at uh, a global pandemic. So at this point, it's about um, helping the state keep it between the white lines. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Eric Reddick, welcome. You're running as a Republican, I believe. Is that right? Why don't we unmute you? Why don't oh, you yes. I am a Republican, running as a Republican. Perfect. Would you tell us why you're running and what qualifies you? Absolutely. I am running um, because I would really like to see uh, fiscal responsibility and, uh, and a real strong economic recovery for the state of Vermont. So one of the things that the pandemic has highlighted is that our economy is almost wholly dependent on tourism. And what we really need here in Vermont is to produce things. So the way that you get more money into your state is to produce things that people outside of your state want to purchase. It's a great way to bring in revenue. We want to open up opportunities for small businesses, for entrepreneurs, and other corporations to really thrive here so we can grow our tax base and afford all of the environmental initiatives and um, justice initiatives that we want. Uh, every Vermonter wants a safe, healthy, and clean lake, clean air, and all of those things, but we have to make sure that we pay for it responsibly rather than continuing to add the weight to the lower and middle class who is just moving out. So we wanna really retain people here. I'm qualified because I've spent the last 20 years as an accountant helping other businesses succeed, thrive, grow, and, and really take off. Having that background in accounting and economics allows me, I think will allow me to really focus Vermont's energy on the things that will move us forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erica. Tom Chastanay, you're also running as a Republican. Welcome. Tell us why you're running and what qualifies you for State Senate of Chittenden County. Well, thank you. I'm Tom Chastanay. As you said, I'm running for a Republican seat in Chittenden County. I'm a lifelong Vermont resident. I was born and raised in South Burlington, attended South Burlington High, uh, UVM in the early 70s. I've been self-employed since the mid-70s till my retirement. Um, I, um, I was trained as an accountant, but I ended up running a, a fuel oil business in general construction, go figure. Uh, running the fuel oil business and the general construction, I, I learned both sides of the equation, how to read a balance sheet, profit and loss, how to manage employees and how to meet a payroll and a balanced uh, budget. Um, I think I have a lot to offer to the state. And now that I'm retired, I would like to be able to apply some of the skills that I've acquired over those 40 years to the management of the state. Um, grow the economy, uh, attract business, uh, hopefully have a less adversarial attitude towards business here in the state. And uh, more business, more jobs, more prosperity. And that's the reason I'm running. Thank you very much. <laughs> Senator Ginny Lyons, 
Welcome. Tell us why you're running for re-election and what qualifies you. Uh, thank you, Lauren Glenn, and thank you, Channel 17 Town Meeting TV for uh, again hosting these wonderful uh, opportunities for each of us. Uh, we are in the middle of volatile times. We're in the middle of a pandemic. We don't know when it will end. We are also in the middle of some significant social unrest in our country, and now we're seeing it in our state. We need experienced leadership to carry our state forward, to patch the holes that we have found during the pandemic. Those are economic holes, public health holes, social holes, environmental holes. We've started to work on that during this session. And as Senator Baruth has indicated, we just finished that session. It's a, it was a marathon. I wanna say that my experience as chair of my select board in Williston for many years, my work in the Senate as chair of committees in the Senate and currently uh, chairing uh, the Health and Welfare Committee uh, has provided me with the sets of values and the expertise that we need to find solutions going forward. We are currently reliant on federal dollars to close the gaps with uh, COVID, and we will continue to rely on those federal dollars. So um, I look forward to working on healthcare, housing, food security, energy, and systems that will change our racial and other inequities in our state. Thank you so much. So we're gonna just start with the uh, first formal question. I'll just remind folks, if you're watching, you are welcome to call us at 802-862-396. Our phones are open. We would love to hear from you if you have any questions for the candidates. Um, the first question I have, we're gonna start with you, Eric Reddick, is uh, about budget priorities. You know, as the two senators mentioned, this session just ended. Um, they just buttoned up the F21, FY21 budget. Um, the work now begins on FY22. And what are your priorities in terms of managing what is very difficult and tight budget situation for the state? That is a really great question. Um, I think the one thing first that is a very inconvenient conversation that no one wants to address is we're going to have to cut services. Um, I think it's not only unreasonable, but unfair to expect federal dollars to dig us out of this hole. I think it's unfair to ask the rest of the country to fix the problems that have been created by policies uh, that really, you know, um, make Vermont poor, really for no reason. Um, you know, we, we make ourselves poor with our high taxes and high regulations. So we need to cut some services. We need to button up those services to make sure that there's not fraud and people taking advantage of it. But most importantly, we really need to open up our economy. We need to make it easier for people to build buildings so that we don't have such a housing shortage. We need to make it easier for people to start businesses. We need to make it easier for people to succeed here so that we can fill those, those budget holes. And <laughs> I, I just found it interesting that Senator Lyons fra phrased it as, we need experienced legislators to fill the holes we found. But from my experience, the current legislators or the experienced legislators are the ones who have created those holes. Like the $500 billion deficit we're facing here between regular budget and the pensions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Tom Chastany, your approach to the FY22 budget, would you cut spending, raise revenue, redistribute resources? What's your approach? I would definitely cut spending. I'd uh, redistribute, uh, put other priorities uh, in place, uh, how we spent our money. Um, I, th I think uh, an emphasis on uh, attracting business here to the state should be priority one. Uh, where we're hearing a lot about how the uh, pandemic has put us in a hole, and it has, but we were in a financial mess before the, the pandemic hit here. We've had, uh, what is it, a, a $4 billion shortfall in long-term liabilities, pensions and uh, stuff. Our, our roads and infrastructures have to be maintained. 
Um, if we can get some business here and attract business, maybe with uh, uh, tax uh, incentives, uh, we get a more business, more jobs, more jobs, more revenue. Um, hopefully with more uh, revenue, uh, we can uh, I, I do something about the high cost of living here in Vermont. Um, we should do something to uh, make uh, homes affordable for the average Vermonter. Uh, we're, we're, that's a, a real crisis and uh, has to be attended to. Uh, I think we have onerous and um, arbitrary land use regulations that, that are driving up the cost of housing in Vermont, and that has to be attended to. Uh, these are probably some of the solutions that should be done. I'm going to move on to Senator Lyons, um, but I'm going to circle back to both of you. You both mentioned um, cutting services. So could you just mull over what services you would recommend cutting? And um, I'll come back. Ginny Lyons, your approach to the FY22 budget. Uh, thank you. I almost said thank you, Mr. President. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you know, I have to say that Vermont is one of the healthiest states in terms of our budget and our ability to manage our revenue. Uh, we are one of the few states that has, uh, for the last few years, seen uh, a, what I would call, we don't call it a rainy day fund anymore, but it is a rainy day fund. It's uh, resources that are available to us each year to put into the budget as we go forward. Yes, we are going to see a hundred million dollar gap next year, but the way that the budget has been uh, planned and put forward each year has allowed for us to access those dollars that are essentially a savings going forward. So our budget management, I think, is exceptional. And I, I applaud our appropriations committees for their work, as well as others, including um, Senator Bruce's work on education, uh, my work and others' work uh, on uh, health and welfare to ensure that the services that are being offered are the services that people need. We can't get into that situation where we say either business or people. People are our business. And so the services that we offer in our state are, are important. And I think we've done a good job of managing them. In terms of the, the comments about, um, I, I'm gonna stop, but in terms of the comments, about the, the dollars, that, the $500 million, we're making up for lost time, both from Republican and Democratic um, administrations in the past that have not fulfilled obligations on uh, retirement funds. So uh, all of the things that you mentioned, Lauren Glenn, are always on the table. Cut spending, raise revenue, redistribute redistrib funds, and we see examples of those every year. Uh, but we're, we're in a good place right now. Thank you, you so much. It's a bad place. <laughs> Phil Baruth, your approach to the FY22 budget. Sure. Um, we don't have a lot of time, so I want to focus on one area that I think is critical. And I'm hoping that Erica and Tom would agree with me on this one. And that is saving the state college system. And the reason why I say that is uh, supporting higher education is sometimes a difference between the parties but it was a very bipartisan outcry when ex-Chancellor Spalding announced the possible closure of three campuses, Johnson, Linden, and Randolph Center. And the reason was that would create huge drain on jobs in those areas. Those are job engines for those three communities. That's the only educational institution in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, so what that requires is a bridging loan, which we did this time around, not a loan, but uh, bridging funding. And so we normally give about $32 million a year. We upped that to about close to 55 million this year using uh, federal CARES Act money. There's now a select committee that's looking at reorganizing the system and reforming it with the idea that we will find a permanent funding source for increased revenue to the state colleges going forward. So I'm making the argument that the tax and regulate legislation 
which we passed and which the governor has indicated he may well sign, um, that that money be plugged into the need for the state college system because there's nothing better for growing the middle class, helping Vermonters in need, and producing jobs in those areas, including the Northeast Kingdom. So that's a that's a chunk of revenue, but I think the return on that investment is more than what you would uh, look at going into it. Uh, Thank you. I think I am. I'm having a little internet lag, so I'm sorry if I'm not hopping right on the end there. Um, Thank you. So I imagine that you're done there, Phil. Yes. Is that right? Thank you. Okay, Erica, just 30 seconds on what you would cut. Well, for starters, one of the things I point out are the solar panel subsidies, um, which really are a wealth transfer from the lower and middle class to the upper class. Uh, most people who can afford to install and maintain solar panels are high income earners. And yet, tax dollars from lower and middle class Vermonters are being used for those subsidies. And there are a number of subsidies like that, that in my opinion, again, are a wealth transfer from the poor and middle class to the wealthy. And I just really quick, I'm afraid I said $500 billion deficit. I meant to say $5 billion deficit. So between 4.5 pension deficit and the regular budget deficit, $5 billion dollar deficit and we've uh and we've had a credit downgrade so savings sounds nice except when you hear that we have had a credit downgrade which will cost tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in additional interest expense because we're not being good with our budget thank you thank you so much tom chastney what would you cut in 30 seconds what would I cut? Well, to begin with, we are put, I, I believe, a half a million dollars right now to uh, institute the Global Warming Initiative to uh, uh, fund the committee to look into how we're going uh, to, to operate it. Um, I, I, w- I agree with uh, Erica about the um, solar panel initiative. Uh, I think an across the board uh, cut of five percent or whatever the percentage would be uh, like your household budget you have to pay your bills you have to meet a deadline and you have to make hard decisions sometimes and everybody has their pet project okay. that wants to be wants to be funded but uh, you just have to make Thank hard you. decisions great we're gonna go on to the next question we're gonna go on to the next question which has to do with health care so healthcare and Tom, we're starting with you. Um, the inequities and the imbalances in the distribution of healthcare resources has become very uh, obvious during this health pandemic. Um, what's what do you think is next in terms of state policy on healthcare coverage for all Vermonters? Well, that's a tough question. You know, we've been struggling with this for what thirty years, uh, and nobody's come up with a good solution for it. I'm not a healthcare expert by any stretch of the imagination. Um, we need a minimum standard of care for everybody, of course. I just, I don't think anybody gets turned away from the emergency room at their hospital. We have one of the highest uh, standards of uh, healthcare of anywhere in the world. We're always uh, holding up the Canadian uh, model as, as what we should emulate, but. Uh, when it's something serious, they come down here for the uh, procedure. People come from Europe, from England for our procedure. You, you have three components to your health care. You've got uh, with the quality of the care, you've got the cost of the care, and you've got uh, exclusivity. How many people are, are you covering? Um, you can't have all three. You can't have universal health care, quality health care, and uh, cost-effective health care. I don't think that's going to happen. So once again, hard decisions have to be made and uh, we'll have to delve into that uh, some more. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Ginny Lyons, your program issue and policy going forward. Thank you. Uh, I've been working very hard in this area for the past several years 
And obviously the pandemic has intruded greatly, but the pandemic has allowed us to see the importance of healthcare as a business in our state. And, how, and one thing that we have recognized is how important it is to stabilize the businesses, the healthcare businesses. For example, if you look at some of the primary care businesses in our rural parts of the state, they are imploding. They're, they've had to close. It's only through the Corona Relief Funds that we're able to provide funding for those businesses to stay open so that they can bridge the gap until the pandemic is over. And I don't see that happening anytime soon. Uh, it's not, the vaccine isn't gonna be around soon. And so we're going to have to keep our eyes open. One of the things that the state of Vermont is doing that has reached national attention is we have what is known as an all payer model, a payment per member per month. And that includes payment for uh, services for folks with chronic illnesses and for primary care. That program uh, is stabilizing uh, our healthcare businesses in this state and serves as an important model going forward. There are a lot of areas that I look forward to working on and continuing work on, and the, the all-payer model is one, with or without um, a coalition of hospitals uh, driving that. It, it is more than that. It is all the businesses of healthcare. We also need to look at the transparency of costs, and we just recently passed a bill that I think the governor will sign that allows for uh, the development of a dashboard so people can see what the costs are for their acute care in hospitals, so that people can see what the costs are before they go in for that treatment. That's a big step forward. We're also building other transparencies uh, in, within the system. And uh, so I'm looking forward to continued work, prescription drugs, insurance, and so on and so forth, so that everyone has access to the public good of healthcare. Thank you so much. Um, we're gonna give everybody two minutes on this question because I think it's an important one. Um, Phil Baruth, what's your approach to healthcare policy going forward for Vermont? Uh, well, I would, I would differ with Tom in, in the sense that I do believe it's possible for us like other industrialized nations around the world to have a system where everyone is included Everyone has access to quality health care, and you don't have people excluded. Tom talked about we had to make hard decisions. If the hard decision means certain segments of the population don't get the same level of treatment, I oppose that strongly. So my wife is from Sweden, and I've spent quite a lot of time looking at their system. In Sweden, nobody goes without uh, medical care. They have uh, additionally, subsidized childcare um, and most people you talk to have some disposable income left over to travel and do other things. And that's because over the last 80 or so years, they have looked at and figured out how to use different levels of taxation to make sure that everybody doesn't go bankrupt from paying for healthcare, paying for education uh, and paying for their old age. So once those things are taken care of, then people can concentrate on living their lives the way we'd all like to live our lives, free from crushing debt. Um, I'll just give you one last example. I, about 10 years ago, I had an incident that uh, I, I passed out, uh, hit my head on a table. It was the middle of the night. I got taken in an ambulance to the hospital. They were worried I might've had a heart attack. So they ran a huge battery of tests and I was taken out without my wallet, so they didn't know who I was, and they didn't know whether I had health care. And so I finally got sent a bill for $130,000 for less than 24 hours in the system. And then when they found out I had Blue Cross Blue Shield, it went down to about 300. Now that tells you that if somebody doesn't have a job that provides them health care, they are screwed to the wall and that's not America, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you very much. Erica Reddick, your view of healthcare policy for Vermont going forward, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this is also a, a hot topic for me as a person with a chronic health uh, condition. 
And I had the experience of having affordable individual health care because I am an entrepreneur and small business owner. So I don't have an employer to give me insurance. And when the Affordable Care Act was passed, I lost my health insurance because of the rate increases and how much bureaucracy was added. Whereas before I had good health insurance that I could afford, I no longer could afford it because I made too much money to get a subsidy and not enough money to actually afford the premiums and the deductibles and the actual care that I needed. That's why I'm a big proponent of, of running healthcare as a business, as Senator Lyons brought up. But here in Vermont and throughout our country, healthcare providers are actually not allowed to run their businesses as businesses. They're dictated to by the government what they're allowed to do, what they're allowed to spend, and how they care for their patients. And I personally think that the government should not be the person deciding what kind of care I get. I think that me and my doctor and my family are better able to make those decisions. So I would actually love to see Vermont healthcare providers be able to run their business as a business, as was stated earlier. Also, the Sweden model would be great if uh, we were a country of only a few million people with a stronger capitalist system than we have here in the States or Vermont in particular. So a very homogenous culture that's smaller, that doesn't have the same problems with various health conditions and things to struggle with. Sweden can do that much easier and they have a much more robust and open economy than we do here. So we would need to, we would need to open that up. We would need to deregulate. We would need to lower taxes. And then maybe we could actually have the Sweden model. That would be lovely. Oh, I think I'm getting uh, noticed that I need to stop. But I really do think we can do better here than what we have right now. Thank you so much. Tom, just Thank in you. the interest of um, equal time, do you have another 30 seconds you'd like to add on this question? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, my, my three proponents of health care, my three foundations of the health care, I was just pointing out that uh, you can't have top quality health care, you can't have universal coverage, and you can't have reasonable uh, cost. Three of those don't come together one of them's going to give up. So what you get, as in the case of Sweden or Canada or Great Britain, you get rationed health care. Yep. Uh, if you're an older person, uh, 75 years old, you need an open heart, well, too bad, get to the end of the line. Uh, that's all my, my point was. We okay, have, uh, we're good. That's 30 seconds. All right, thank you. Let's go on um, to the question of reparations. Um, this is a conversation that has evolved and gained traction in our country and in our state. And um, I guess the question that I have here is, what do you think the response to the institutional racism of the, that exists within the state and the country is in Vermont? Do you support reparations? Um, do you, what form would that take? And how would you address um, the long-term imbalance of rights and powers for black Americans that live in Vermont. So we're going to actually start with Ginny on that question. Uh, thank you. That, that's a question that I think is so far, goes fo so far back in history that it, it does make it difficult to answer, but it isn't difficult for me because the injustices that people have sustained over time have been significant. The, this legislature recently passed a bill that removes uh, slavery from, will remove slavery from our constitution. That is an important step forward. I see that as part of the reparation. Every bill that we pass that talks about uh, reducing systemic racism or reducing disparity, as we did when we uh, have put money into our, um, our health care for our uh, indigenous uh, and our BIPOC uh, populations. When we, when we do that, when we pass those bills, we are making reparations for policies that have held people hostage because of who they are by virtue of their genetics or their appearance. Uh, when I asked the question, the question that you sent us said, 
uh, what about you know reparations and paying people for all the terrible things that have happened? And I think my thoughts are, I think we need to move forward. We need to continue our work on reducing systemic racism. We need to continue our work on reducing uh, the effects that we see in our public safety system. We need, to, we need to work on those policies and bills that will bring equity and equality uh, for uh, all people in our state. So um, I said there are some people who won't like that answer, but I, I feel very strongly that having uh, racial justice in our state, state through a culture of change in our schools, uh, in our institutions is critically important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Phil Baruth, let me actually read the question. Um, H478 is an act relating to establishing a task force to study and consider a state apology and proposal for reparations for the institution of slavery. Do you think this will be reintroduced next biennium? Are reparations an appropriate response to white privilege? What ideas would you offer the task force and how should Vermont reckon with its history and institutions of racism? You're on mute. Let's unmute you. There we go. Yep, perfect. Thank you. I do support the idea of a task force to look into this. Um, it's a, a fantastically complex question. So I think it's appropriate to have all the stakeholders um, do their work, listening to people around the state, looking through the history, and then uh, attempting to propose some, some thoughts on how to go forward with it. I would just break it into two, two different ideas. Um, social justice, as Ginny said, is one thing and eliminating bias from the systems of government and other systems we have in the state. So we have passed a number of bills over the last few years, establishing an officer of the director of uh, equity in, in Vermont. And then uh, my committee, the education committee, passed H1, which was, uh, we call it the ethnic studies bill designed to look through the curriculum and Title 16, our educational laws, to make sure that we're not repeating or institutionalizing bias in our schools. So those kind of things are going on, but reparations, I think you can look at in two ways. Um, it's always financial. I think um, the question is, do you um, think of it as money that would be given to individuals, or do you think of it as programs that would allow them access to capital, uh, enterprise zones, those sorts of things. And I think of the two, the second route makes a little more sense to me. The idea that we would say, if, if what we can do is to increase land ownership and capital holding among communities of color, there are different ways to do that besides the state issuing a check and considering its work done. Thank you very much. Eric Reddick, um, what is your, what are your thoughts on this question about how Vermont should reckon with its history and institution of racism? Do you support reparations? And what recommendations would you have for the task force studying whether the state should make an apology and offer reparations? Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And I, uh, Senator Baruth and I agree in one area, so that's amazing. Um, and I just wanted to give that a, a thumbs up. Further to his point, well, let me back up. As a woman who is married to a black man, where half of my family is Mexican, uh, half of, well, I guess a third of my family is Mexican, a third of it is now black or mixed race, I have a vested interest in making sure that we have a just and equitable system for everyone, because that is the promise of all men are created equal, that we will all be treated equally under the law. And that is the best thing that we can hope for. So if we want to make sure that people of color and um, disadvantaged communities can overcome the wealth gap or things like that, that, that are real, we are facing that, right? So Vermont has the lowest wealth gap of any state in the union. We have the lowest income gap of any state in the union, but it still exists. 
And my husband and I agree that the best way to make sure that people do not have to deal with discrimination is to provide them the ability to make their own opportunities. Um, I've faced discrimination and housing and employment for things that I've struggled with. And uh, my husband being a dark skinned black man doesn't have a lot of people that he can stunt double for as a person in the film industry. So he has a really hard time. And he said, you know what? If they're not putting people that look like me in movies, then I'm going to make my own movies. And I just really think that encouraging that kind of spirit, entrepreneurship, small business owner, uh, ownership is how we really get people through having to ask permission for a job, having to ask permission for anything. When we help people help themselves, they don't become dependent on the government. And that's what we should be going for. Thank you, Erica. Tom Chastanay, your view on reparations and the state's approach to its institutional racism. Uh, okay, um, I'm reading the question there that we prepared for, and it was about Vermont's uh, history of uh, slavery. Did I read that wrong? Uh, I, I wasn't it's an act relating to establishing a task force to study and consider a state apology and proposal for reparations for the institution of slavery. It will likely be reintroduced in the next biennium. Are repara reparations an appropriate response to white privilege? And what ideas would you offer the task force? And how should Vermont reckon with its history and institutions of racism? In two minutes, please. Okay, well, I don't know what institutions of racism were in Vermont. I, I do know that, uh, you know, we fought a civil war and lost 200,000 uh, Union soldiers to end slavery, and Vermont was in the forefront of that. We had the uh, highest percentage of uh, casualties for our population. I'm, I'm not sure what systemic racism is. Um, I'm, I've never seen any good examples of it here. You said uh, institutional racism initially when you in, introduced this, and I don't think there's any institutional racism going on. Um, as uh, a descendant of immigrants who definitely didn't have anything to do with uh, slavery in this country, I don't know why we have to apologize for something we didn't do. Um, no, no, and, and reparations. Um, go to some working family up in the Northeast Kingdom and ask them why they want to take their tax dollars to say to, to give to Obama, Obama's two daughters uh, to make up for all the uh, suffering they've had to endure for their systemic racism. No, I, I'm not in agreement with this at all. All right. Thank you. Um, let's go to the F-35. Now that Chittenden County is experiencing the flyovers of the F-35s, what have you heard from constituents about noise, health, and safety impacts? And we're going to start with Phil Bruth. So believe it or not, there was a moment in time where I was the highest ranking official in the state of Vermont to oppose the basing of the F-35 here. I was the majority leader and my communities uh, that I represent, Winooski, South Burlington, Burlington, uh, Williston, they were looking at having a significant up, upgrade in terms of the amount of noise they were dealing with. I looked into it. It didn't seem to me to make sense for the basing to be in a, a metropolitan area, the most populous area in the state given the other choices that the federal government had. So I did oppose them. I was told that I was crazy because the noise wouldn't be any different from the F-16. Well, I'm here to tell you, if you go to Winooski or you go to Williston, in fact, Ginny and I have been on many Zoom calls over the last uh, many months, and the F-35s will start in one of our areas, and then in 10 seconds, they show up in, in the others and you have to stop speaking because it's deafening. So I don't believe that does anybody's property values any good. And I don't think it was necessary in a military sense. 
the argument is always jobs, jobs, jobs. But from what I understand, the planes cannot be repaired in state and they have to be repaired out of state. So I, you know, I, I think it's unfortunate that the basing was here. Now that they're here, our options are extremely limited. Thank you very much. Erica Reddick, unmute yourself and tell us, uh, we've been hearing about from people in the community about the noise, health and safety impacts and your view of the F-35's placement in our county. Uh, it's This is such a hard question to answer. <laughs> this is the one I'm the most afraid of answering, funny enough. Um, you know, I have mixed feelings about the F-35s. Um, I've heard from constituents on both sides who say that that jet noise is the sound of freedom. Uh, and then I've heard from people who say that it gives them anxiety and it makes it harder, you know, with, especially with all the stuff that we're going through. So the question then becomes, if we decide not to host them, uh, where do we make up the budget shortfall? So the federal government pays us millions of dollars to have those planes here. And so if we're not going to have them here, how are we going to make up that budget shortfall? Uh, number one. So, so this is one of those things I, have, I don't have a firm opinion on, um, but I'm willing to have the conversation with people. If you can tell me where the money's going to come from, okay, well, let's talk a little bit more about it. And then I think about the fact that we have one of the most highly uh, regarded Air Force bases in the country. So the fact that we even got the F-35s and previously had the F-16s is because the Green Mountain Bo Boys have such a high level of integrity and do such good work for uh, keeping our country safe. And as I recall, we were the first, our Air Guard were the first to be on site uh, during 9-11, during the attacks on 9-11. So if we're going to give up that strategic base, where do we replace it? Thank you. Thank you very much. Tom Chastening, your view of the F-35s and what have you heard from the folks the that you've been speaking with? I have property in South Burlington. I have my office in South Burlington. Uh, frankly, I've been down by the airport, East Island Drive, and uh, heard uh, both the F-16s. Uh, and the F-35s, and I can't tell a difference between the two of them. Um, I haven't heard a lot of negative comments from the people I've been talking to uh, about it. Uh, and I think when we as civilians uh, tell the, uh, the military how to run their business, I think that's out of our pay, pay grade, frankly. Um, no, I would uh, leave the F-35s right where they are. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Can you lines your views on the F-35s and what have you heard from your constituency? Uh, thank you. Um, so let's begin with that. The F-35s are here. And I, have, I continue to hear from my constituents about the noise and about the safety. I hear from Winooski. I hear from South Burlington. They're a little bit from Williston and I live in Williston. So I hear them go over and what Senator Bruce said about the planes turning off conversation is very real. You can't be on the phone and also have the planes fly over. The, the most, I think now it's a question of making sure that the zone for sound mitigation is, uh, is accurate and that the people who live in neighborhoods in South Burlington, in Winooski, um, in Williston uh, are, are, are helped. I think in particular for the Chamberlain School and the kids who are there in South Burlington and how much help they need. So it isn't a trivial question at all. Uh, having, having the stress of the noise and for some people concerns about a uh, possible uh, crash, uh, it, it, it's very real. So uh, so far, uh, I think we're hearing that sound mitigation is going to take place. I haven't heard recently about that. Uh, the, the unfortunate part about all of this is how uh, the Burlington International Airport is in the middle of a conversation with a uh, federal authority. So I will leave it at that for now. 
Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to just remind folks if you are watching and you have a question for our candidates, we have a few more minutes if you would like to give us a call at 802-862-3966. Next question, starting with Erica Reddick. Do you support climate change legislation and how would you use your role as senator to address the impacts of climate change on Vermont? That is a great question. Um, and I want to I want to parse out a little bit climate change versus environmental legislation, if I can do that. Um, we, you know, I I always say one of the myths about conservatives is that we don't believe in climate change, and and that's not true. Um, we just disagree on the government's role in how we should address it. So um, I am I am not for the Global Warming Solutions Act as an example for a number of reasons. Uh, you know, one is that it gives power to outside people outside of Vermont to sue us if we don't make uh, the goals that have been set. Um, I don't like the idea of giving control and power to set regulations to an unelected group of individuals that are unaccountable to Vermonters. I don't like the amount of control that they'll have, the blank check that they get from the legislature to do whatever is required. I think that is really troublesome. I think a number of the environmental um, bills that have been passed and solutions that are being put forth unnecessarily bankrupt our farms, our businesses, and the state of Vermont in general. Like the three acre rule is incredibly destructive. It's intended for uh, saving the lake but we're not holding cities like Burlington accountable for the millions of gallons of raw sewage that they dump into our lake. So what I'm for, for the climate and for the environment is common sense legislation that actually uh, helps make our environment re better rather than offshoring our pollutions to foreign countries, given that Thank we are already a carbon sequestering state. Thank you very much. Tom Chastney, how would you use your role as Senator to address the impact of climate change in Vermont? Well, I, I wouldn't be passing the climate change resolution. I wouldn't be voted for that, that's for sure. Uh, I don't think we have any idea about the economic impacts that that's going to happen and people don't realize uh, what they're going to have to give up to meet the goals that are, are stated there. Uh, they're, gas fireplace, your wood stove, your backyard barbecue, your uh, um, your lawnmower, uh, four-wheeler, or whatever. Um, the, the, the poor guy that's got to have a three-quarter ton pickup truck to do a snow plowing or uh, work isn't going to be able to afford the, the penalties that are going to be put on him for to register those. Uh, yep. those um, and the Global warming uh, isn't, uh, the argument hasn't been resolved. It isn't set. There's lots of people who would uh, differ uh, with the, the causes of global warming, if it's CO2, um, if it's man-made and how much there is. 97% of the CO2 that's in the atmosphere is naturally occurring. 3% uh, is man-made. Uh, plants thrive on that uh, carbon dioxide is a greening the planet. If the temperature is rising one and a half degrees over the last 150 years, which is debatable, um, is that part of a naturally occurring cycle or not? You've got people like uh, Richard uh, Lindzen, who's a MIT atmospheric physicist that uh, strongly disagrees with uh, the uh, global uh, warming initiatives. Um, Christopher Essex, another uh, professor of applied mathematics who does climatic uh, models. Ten seconds. Uh, so, uh, no, I wouldn't be passing that, uh, that resolution by law. Thank you. Thank you. Ginny Lyons, how would you use your role as senator to oppress, address the impacts of climate change on Vermonters? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, as, as you may or may not know, I have worked for many years first to establish our first uh, greenhouse gas reduction goals back in 2006 or seven. I always forget what year it was. We also have uh, 
done excellent work in our state on uh, weatherization through uh, Efficiency Vermont and building a fund to help people weatherize their homes, whether it be summer or winter. And uh, so I will continue work in that area. One of the things that um, I authorized, we law authorized through legislation, I happen to be the one that wrote it, was um, to allow for Efficiency Vermont to use both electric and thermal fun, funds uh, and commingle those funds so that they can do a full analysis of both thermal needs and electric needs when folks upgrade their home. So a new furnace or a new insulation for their uh, electrical wiring for electric heat pumps and so on. Our next steps really are critically important because we need to have uh, additional um, renewable energy sources so that we can provide electricity for our emerging uh, electric vehicle and uh, additional electric needs around the state. So um, it, I have signed on to the Green New Deal. Uh, there's a lot of work to, that has to go on before that uh, bill is passed. It isn't fait accompli, what it means for people or for taxes. It, uh, we, have, we have many steps to go and I look forward to working on supporting new business initiatives that will help us and um, uh, begin a, a broader reduction of greenhouse gases. Thank you. Phil Baruth, your role as Senator to address the impacts of climate change on Vermont, your analysis, please. Sure. <clears throat> I just wanna point out that um, Erica and Tom told you everything that they wouldn't do to fight climate change neither of them named a single thing that they would do to fight climate change. And the time for that is done. Uh, Tom is disputing the basic science. That argument is over, that ship has sailed. The and, argument's not over, Phil, no. Well, obviously not for you, Tom. No. Um, so what I would say is Vermont and the nation are already experiencing climate change refugees. So my sister moved here to Winooski from California uh, a year and a half ago because California had gotten way, way too hot for her to live in. It was 120 degrees in the summer. It was over 100 in the winter. If her air conditioning broke, she and her daughter were threatened, their health was threatened, and she just couldn't do it anymore. So she moved here, and I think in that way there might be some silver lining for northern states. But basically, the United States and, and the globe are in the midst of a, a crisis. So we overrode the governor's veto of the Global Warming Solutions Act, which puts legal standards in place and creates a stick for the state of Vermont if it doesn't meet them. And that's what was lacking in previous legislation was a stick to make sure that we lived up to our legal obligations. So uh, like it, don't like it. Um, Propose something else if you say you oppose it. Can I Thank you. Respond to that, please. Go ahead, Tom. Okay. Uh, nobody's arguing that the climate doesn't change. It's always changed throughout history through millions of years. You had the ice ages, you had the dinosaurs, you, uh, and we have natural cycles uh, that are happening. Uh, the question is how much is man's impact on that, and what are we doing? to uh, facilitate that climate change. That's where the argument is. Um, Thank you. I, We're gonna go to closing comments. And Tom, you actually begin, and you're gonna have a minute to close the forum tonight, today. Oh, oh goody. Uh, let's see here. I'm... Uh, <clears throat> Caught me off guard on that one. Uh, well, I'll say like uh, Reagan said before in the 1980s, if you're happy with the state of Vermont and the state of uh, the government and how things are run, um, vote the uh, same people back in. Uh,
but uh, if you want to change, you know, uh, I've been a small business owner here for 40 years, uh, small business general construction. Um, I didn't only manage the business, I drove the truck, I delivered the oil, I repaired the heating systems, I built the houses, I got calluses on my hand. And over that time, I've been in contact with thousands of people. Uh, and I think it's given me a, a unique perspective of, on the uh, insights and needs and concerns of the average Vermonter. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned about the direction the state's headed. Uh, the legislature seems more concerned with social engineering than a traditional focus uh, on making sure that our hard-earned tax dollars are managed responsibly. Our, our roads, infrastructures, maintained safe neighborhoods. Safe neighborhoods, uh, that's good. something. We're good. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sorry to cut you off. Ginny Lyons, your closing comments, please. Uh, thank you. Thanks again, Lauren Glenn, for having us. Uh, just so folks know, uh, my in a, my past and current life, I'm a college biology professor. I'm a scientist by trade. And I look at things, uh, I look at policies to have data and inf information available for decision making. And that's what I will continue to take into the Senate. We haven't talked a lot today about how our children are faring during the pandemic. We have a lot of ground to cover there. I look forward to going back and working on the Child Protection Oversight Committee, the Healthcare Reform Oversight Committee, and, and continuing our work to ensure that the two degree increase temperature in Vermont in the summer and the four degree increase in temperature in Vermont in the winter doesn't continue. We aren't gonna see skiing, we won't see maple industry, and we won't see other things that we very much care about in Vermont if we don't take care of this great environmental concern. Thank, Thank you again. You. And I look forward to representing my county again. Uh, please uh, consider voting for me. Thank you very much. Phil Baruth, your closing comments, please. You have a minute. As I said earlier, I'm chair of Senate education now, and I just wanna mention two really basic things that we did. Before the pandemic, we passed the strictest standard in the nation for lead in drinking water in schools. So if you have a kid in school, your school has now been tested. If you have a kid at a childcare center, your center has been tested and the state paid to remediate any problems. So that's safe water. In terms of safe air, after the pandemic, we realized that the single best use of COVID money from the federal government to prevent the spread of the pandemic was to improve air quality in schools. So my committee in the Senate created a $13.5 million program run by Efficiency Vermont to upgrade your school district's HVAC and air handling systems. Those were two basic ways uh, I tried to think about you, your family, your kids, and general safety. Uh, if you send me back, that's the kind of work I'll be doing every day. And I thank you for your vote and I ask for it again. Thank you very much. Erica Reddick, closing comment, one minute. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I want to just acknowledge Senator Baruth mentioning that for the climate, I didn't talk about things that I would do. And that was a fair critique. Um, I will say that in all of these questions, what I will do is seek data, seek information, and seek experts who will tell us what, uh, what kind of outcomes we can expect to see from the kind of legislature that we pass. And then I will require metrics and measuring of those things that we do. Because a lot of times we see uh, government just adding more money on top of already inefficient systems. And so what I look forward to doing in Vermont as your Senator, please go to my website, Erica for Senate.com or Erica Reddick.com, both work. Check out my detailed economic plan that covers all of the ways that I will work for you, Vermont, to make things happier, healthier, and more livable for Vermonters. Thank, Thank you. you so much. We've been speaking with four of the 13 candidates for Chittenden County State Senate. The second forum will follow. We really appreciate your time today, this sunny, beautiful Saturday. And uh, thank you very much for your public service. We appreciate it. For all of us at Town Meeting TV, please stay tuned. 
to continuing coverage of general election 2020.